So hello, welcome. Thank, thank you. you so much. I appreciate it. Um, thank you everyone for joining us to our sem this semester's first segment of careers in public service. My name is Annika Laplante and I'm a student assistant at the Graham Center. And I will be your host for this program in conjunction with our friends at Graham 20. So before we kick this off, I just wanna go over today's agenda and then some quick Zoom housekeeping. Full disclosure, like I mentioned before, this is our first hybrid program. So in advance, oh, we expected some hiccups, but <laughs> thank you for your, your patience. Um, turning back to our agenda, we are excited for this opportunity to speak with the Honorable Mignon Clyburn, a former commissioner with the Federal Communications Commission. We will first hear uh, from her about her life in public service, and then we will open it to Q&A. So because we will have a little bit of maybe some in-person and then definitely virtual presence, for those in person, we can just raise your hands and signal that you have a question. If you're online, if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat throughout you know, the program or the raise your hand function and we will call on you. Please keep your mics muted unless you're asking a question. Um, and thank you. So a little bit about Mignon and then we'll hear from her. So like I said, we are pleased to host you today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, Mignon Clyburn served on the FCC for nine years, where she was an advocate for, um, for bridging the digital divide and modernizing programs for making broadband affordable, championing diversity in media ownership, and pricing it for a free and open internet. Clyburn was appointed to the FCC in 2009 by President Barack Obama for a five-year term. In 2013, she began a second five-year term and served as acting FCC chairwoman from May 20, 2013 to November 4, 2013. Prior to the FCC, she spent 11 years as a member of the 6th District on the Public Service Commission, PSC, of South Carolina. Prior to the PSC, Commissioner Clyburn was the publisher and general manager of her family-founded newspaper for 14 years, the Colso Times, a Charleston-based weekly newspaper. So please join me in giving a virtual welcome to Commissioner Ann Clyburn. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, it's a pleasure to be on campus. You did not uh, welcome in me, me with the best weather, um, but um, I, I really want to thank you. This is my first trip on campus and to your uh, fine city. Um, I am from the great state of South Carolina. I attended, uh, I graduated actually, from the University of South Carolina uh, with a, a degree in banking, finance, and economics. So I was in the uh, business school. And, you know, one of the things, if I can open things up, but I would love for this to be um, interactive, you know, with the uh, in-person and virtual audience is, it's okay not to have it all figured out. Um, I am, my next birthday will be a major one. It will six zero, you can put whatever order, uh, those two digits, and you would be right <laughs> in a whole host of ways. Um, but um, I find myself, um, intentionally reinventing myself every six months, or at least asking myself, am I on the right track? Now, I'm not as organized as many of you. I don't have my T-chart. I don't have everything written. You know, it's, it, it's not all in, in, in virtual stone, but it is in virtual consciousness or an actual consciousness that, um, um, you know, I recognize I'm, I'm at a different phase, but I still act like I'm just beginning um, the journey. And for me, um, professionally and personally, uh, I am finding that rewarding and challenging um, and enriching. Uh, I grew up in a very close-knit um, you know, community uh, where my parents met in jail. They were uh, advocating and, and, and really putting it all on the line uh, to um, enable more opportunities for individuals uh, then in the um, late 50s, early 60s, uh, that looked like me, that did not have the same types of opportunities, that did not have uh, the law on their side, you know, for uh, opportunities to be open for them. They wanted more for themselves and for uh, their children. And they taught us through that journey that it is our obligation as a price of being on this planet to leave it better than we found it. So that has been my refrain and my North Star. Whatever I decide to do, however I reinvent myself every six months, however, um, you know, the, the three job journey that I have, including one that was entrepreneurial, that I decided to, you know, take on the family business, 
that this is um, their journey that I chose. And I will do everything in my power to blend my passion with a purpose. Uh, you know, uh, King, uh, um, Martin Luther King, um, they, they quote him a lot, but he talked about service. And he affirmed that every one of us can serve. No matter your vocation, no matter your zip code, you know, you know, no matter um, you know, uh, you, you know how enriched um, you are economically, everyone has the capacity and, dare I say, the opportunity um, to, to to contribute. So I decided to do it in in, in three, I uh, say, two point five distinct ways. Uh, one, I spent uh, the first fourteen years of my professional career. Um, as a manager of a weekly newspaper, African American oriented weekly newspaper in Charleston, South Carolina. I then became a state public service, we call it, but you call it public utilities commissioner, where I, I sat on that um, agency for at uh, that agency for 11 years, um, basically being your eyes and ears uh, when it comes to those utility companies, making sure that they are doing right by you making sure that we achieve some type of a balance when it comes to their um, obligation and their uh, fiscal ability to serve and, and to, to be viable and your ability to afford the service, be it telephone, water, or energy. Uh, you know, you have a public service commission or a utility commissioner. There's supposed to be that check and balance between you and the company to make sure that the rates that they're charging are just and reasonable. Um, about 10 or so years, you know, I lose a track of time. Um, maybe it's 12 years ago, if I, if I tell the truth. Um, whatever 2009 was, <laughs> um, you know, I became um, uh, the, the incredible honor of being um, named and confirmed for the Federal Communications Commission. It is an 85 year old um, entity or government um, entity that is responsible. I always say if it transmits a signal, the FCC has something to do with it. The internet, telephone, radio, um, you know, uh, what am I forgetting? Uh, tele, you know, television, um, almost everything that uh, emits a signal, the FCC might not regulate it, but it has some type of influence over it. So many people don't realize Anna, that uh, the communications or what some internationally people call ICT, um, you know, information communications technology in the US, it is one sixth of our nation's economy that the ICT helps to fuel. Just think about it. There's nothing in your everyday experience, probably in your every 15 minute experience that you don't have some type of interaction with your device with you know, being connected, especially now um, as learning has become either virtual or more hybrid. So this is one of the most important agencies that few people pay attention to. It um, is um, an international game uh, uh, a changer, meaning the FCC. Uh, and um, it might have, you know, the acronym might just be two le three letters, but it's the most informative, enlightening, enabling three letters uh, that, um, especially during um, you know, this uh, pandemic, uh, that uh, is responsible for um, ensuring that you have more opportunities uh, to learn, to stay healthy, and, uh, and to make your contribution. So I will yield to you for any particular questions uh, here and online. Um, but um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a, a South Carolinian who is uh, uh, committed uh, to doing good and doing well. I just happen to think that they are not mutually exclusive objectives. We can be fiscally responsible because I do want to eat. I do want to be able to buy, buy another soup that's not just yellow. <laughs> and, um, but I also want to leave this place uh, uh, better than I found it. And I, I think that there, there are ways um, and there are opportunities um, for each of us to do that. So let's talk more about uh, that and more. Okay. Sam? Other than yellow, that's you too. Well, well, thank you. <laughs> that's what I was going for. <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier, feel free to, for those of us joining us online, feel free to drop your questions in the chat or use the raise your hand feature. And we can see you on this big computer. Um, and then also in the room, if you have questions. 
presentially raise your hand. Um, I don't see any questions, so I guess I'll pick up or kind of go ahead. Okay. Um, so you've had a long career in public service, working in journalism, working at the state level, and then working at the federal level. Mm -hmm. What's one of the most impactful moments that stands out from your career as this is why we do public service, this is what makes it all worth it? I told a story um, for those of us, those of you who couldn't join us for lunch. I told a story of a young lady that I met who called herself Frenchie. And she, um, I met her on Skid Row. Um, she um, looked very well put together at that point in time. But she told me of a time in her life where she was at her lowest and said that the re one reason why she was so happy to meet me is number one, she didn't think she would ever meet a federal communications commissioner on Skid Row. And, and, and two, that at her lowest, the only address she had was an email address. But that email address was empowering. It allowed her to connect um, electronically to get the types of services she needed uh, in order to lift herself from where she was on Skid Row to where she was at the, the point. In, in which I met her and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping she is continuing to, to thrive. She looks good in yellow too, by the way. <laughs> um, but I was just inspired by her sharing because it was a reminder that sometimes it is truly access to the basics that can be life-changing. And when you are, regardless of your position it's on campus, campus and administrator, um, an activist or a pacifist. You know, all of us, you know, have the opportunity to help someone who is in a less uh, than satisfying position to move to one that's more enriching. We each have the opportunity to be either a cheerleader or a challenger, an enabler of, of opportunities, a closer of these persistent divides, because the reason why you invited me on campus is because we have a very chronic digital divide problem in this nation. And when we talk about the digital divide, a term we've been using for well over 25 years, we're talking about the inability of many to have the access to the digital or the technology or communications tools needed to be um, a part of the, the 21st century connected experience. You do not, these days, walk into a business and apply for a job that is done online. During a pandemic, many of you did not have in-person experiences by way of education, healthcare, or civic engagement that is my, uh, happening online. There are many places in this country where if you qualify or wish to qualify for federal or state services, you have to fill out that application online. How many times did I say online? <laughs> Several. And so, but if you do not have either the physical infrastructure uh, there at your disposal or the economic wherewithal to be able to afford um, an inter a monthly internet connection, then many of the opportunities um, you know, to you are closed or lost. Um, not so long ago, there was a debate um, within the FCC, and I was a part of the debate of what and when or if broadband was an essential service. Now, I've always come from the position that uh, broadband should be treated as a utility. Those of you know who know anything about me, I am very, very, very pro net neutrality. Those principles, I think, are um, emboldening and enabling and, and, and level, have the potential to level the playing field uh, for many. Not all of my colleagues felt that. And uh, some of my colleagues who did not see that, you know, broadband, you know, was it an essential service, that it was more of an option. Lo and behold, we got hit with one of the, uh, a worldwide pandemic. And if there were ever a question, if you know, broadband was a necessity. Painfully, that question got answered. But think about if we had a different type of conversation several years ago, 
where we would be in terms of in ensuring that those students had access uh, to opportunities as opposed to reacting um, and acting um, you know, in a crisis. Crises, reacting, triaging, not only cost more money, way more money, mm -hmm. but when you triage somebody, it is often difficult for them to get back to where their pre-impact um, um, state would be. If you are in a crisis, if they have to take you to the emergency room, you are fortunate if you get back to where you um, were, but very few people come out of an emergency situation whole. And so it is important, I learned a lot from that, uh, that um, it is important to speak up, even if in real time you're not listened to robustly, but it's important for others to listen, even if they politically disagree with you, um, because there is no party or no person from any particular school um, or a part of this you know, country that has all of the answers. So, um, you know, if anything on a campus of higher learning, you have the opportunity to go to experience professors and events and exchanges that may or may not always uh, be a comfort, but many of them will be enlightening, um, whether you embrace them or not. And I think it's an, an important, um, you know, for us to, to be open. So I guess there are a couple of questions you might have to scroll a little bit. Two of them had, um, had the, uh, Jasmine, you asked about uh, the process of being a, a, a chair of the commission. Wonder why you asked that. <laughs> so um, the, the FCC is made up of five commissioners. Back in the day, during the Clinton administration, um, and, and, and many, I don't even know where everybody was going, but back, way back then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. two of us in this room right here, um, but during the administration, uh, doing a very, uh, a, a difficult time uh, during that administration, there was a, a, a settlement made of sorts where these boards and commissions um, that the majority and minority leader would basically have their pick. Of, um, of, of who they would um, offer to be commissioners. But the one thing that was 100% um, the president's choosing was the chair of these various commissions. So the chair of the FCC is chosen by the president of the United States. That means whatever political party the president is, that's the chair. And then there's political balance that's, that's even out between you've got two Republicans or two Democrats or two of not to, to, you know, I, that's all we've had so far, but I'm sure you can have, you know, other parties that would, you know, create, if there were an independent to create that balance. So these are appointed commissions. They're political, obviously, you know, political uh, seats. There is no one formula or, or way, um, 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 uh, traditionally not. Uh, usually the chair is a known quantity in the communication space in some form or fashion, but not necessarily. Um, sometimes they do come from um, industry, sometimes academia, sometimes in the case of me, um, um, I, I came from a state um, agency. So there's no one form other than political proximity. And um, I, I will say, you know, some type of proficiency uh, there. So um, that uh, Jasmine also, at, Jasmine, you, you ask a lot of questions, but I respect that. Um, I, I, it is not posted per se. Um, in terms of um, you know those positions, um, they are definitely uh, appointed positions, and uh, and so it's it's a very interesting um, hybrid. My major was banking and finance and economics. Um, I came into the regulatory space by way of a mentor in South Carolina, who, believe it or not, um, um, had a, a high school degree, degree, but she worked her way up in a manner. And she carried herself in a way that she was one of the most respected people and a door opener, uh, you know, uh, one of the best, um, you know, in, in the business. So she knew, um, you know, she could discern, uh, uh, you know, she had good people skills and good business skills. And what she didn't have by way of a degree, she had everywhere else. So a uh, bank and a finance and um, e economics, 
I sneaked in a couple of um, government and international studies um, uh, uh, courses, which were not recognized by my business school when I went to school back in the early 80s, but would be now. So I would have three degrees. So that's my um, background. You talk a so huh. another question of hers is when it comes to the possibilities of certain colleagues, were you able to have the plans prepared for when the time came to create policies? That's a good, good question in a whole lot of ways. I always, um, so the answer is yes. Uh, and I encourage others to, when you are offering something to what I call it being turnkey ready, ready for a shift if it doesn't work in real time. Um, I was um, uh, uh, pushing for the reforms of, of our inmate calling regime um, in, in, in um, that was a broken system uh, that um, enables uh, those who are incarcerated and uh, their families are being charged a whole lot of money for a little bit of you know com communication to, uh, you know very badly done in, in some cases. That particular petition um, is it, it, not resolved. Uh, when it came before me, it had been uh, idle for like 10 plus years. And I've been gone from the FCC for uh, about, you know, two years. So this has been a long process. So yes, you need to be ready. You need to be ready to wait. And you need to be ready to pounce if the political will and the, uh, you know, things uh, shift. So absolutely, Jasper. So Nicholas is asking, would the FCC be involved in cases where online hacking is an issue? Um, not as, uh, not as, uh, forward, you know, as, as you would think, you know, you've got a number of multiple shared different degrees of, um, of, of, of responsibilities. I will say in terms of, uh, if there were vulnerabilities that were, um, in the system, you know, there were a couple of things that happened. The FCC could find particular companies for their vulnerability, if it is found that there was um, some fraud, often there is some type of security um, uh, efficiency. So I, I guess, let me, let me, Nicholas, let me back up. The answer is yes. Um, you know, uh, that, um, that the results of, of that, um, if it's shown that there's some type of, uh, you know, vulnerability within their systems, the FCC could come find the companies and, and um, affirm that they would, um, you know, fix, you know, what, whatever security breaches or, or protocols have been broken. But the FCC is, is, is rarely alone in um, issues of this nature. So sorry about that uh, shift, Nicholas, you're right. <laughs> and then following- Can I uh, jump in with a question? Go for it. Because it's related to what we've been talking about so far. But I look behind you and I see a lot of pictures of Governor Graham campaigning, shaking hands with people, uh -huh. talking- Back when we shook hands? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Also, like a lot of the faces in those photographs are recognizable in you know, other people yes. that we know because he's campaigning for a seat. Right. So I'm wondering how much you think positions in the FCC and other governmental positions are related to your political ability um, and how much you campaign versus your qualifications, especially since I think a lot of us like want to do exactly what you said with making the world a better place, focusing on the issues that really matter, um, even if we don't have like you know, even right. if we're not like a PK, like I remember you said earlier, like a politician's politician, kid or yes, right. a political ability or something like that. So uh, again, at the beginning, at the end of the day, these are political jobs. And um, when you are uh, in the orbit or not of politicians, um, you know, the, the people who put forth these names have to know who you are. And so um, where you navigate, what, you know, again, I use the word orbit a lot because it's, it's ex extremely applicable. Um, you know, who knows you and what your uh, capabilities and, and abilities are, um, you know, who you have direct lines of communication. So, you know, all of those are applicable. Again, these are politicians um, that meander, you can see by, you know, and, and the people you know, um, I mean, not that they just, appoint political people, but they usually appoint people who are known by political people. So it's, it's very hard in this environment to escape the politics. Hopefully there are very degrees of competence, you know, um, you know that there, there is a, you know, the, the more ideal is to have the connections as well as the, you know, the ability and the, and the background. 
depending on the winds. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Um, uh, there are rumors right now. There, um, there's an opening for the chair at the FCC. Some of you know uh, uh, the FCC is now two-two with an interim chair, and there's a big debate on who the next chair will be. The rumors at one point will it be an academic? You know, you know, will it be you know somebody from the activist community? Mm -hmm. um, there is you know a little resistance for for it being somebody from industry. Um, but I, I will say that, it, you know, depending on what day you catch me, you know, it, you know, the, the tide is, you know, shift uh, in all these either ways. But there are political appointments. Politics has 90% um, to, to, to do with it. Hopefully the rest of your, um, um, you know, preparation, <coughs> preparation will make you uh, eligible. But those are the things you have to think about. Excuse me, you're going to see me drink a little water. Those are the things that you have to keep in mind when, you know, when these jobs come up, it's, it's not, I don't care what you do, um, you know, in, in this universe, you can, you know, politics has something to do with it. On this campus, you know, it, it might not be political in, 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 in the classic sense, but all of this is, you know, it, it's, it's political in nature. And I'll let, I'll let you answer as I am. So, so sorry about that. Yeah, those of you who have fiber moments know what I'm going through right now. I'm <laughs> breathing some fibers for this. No worries. Why you take that break? I'll read the next question. So during your, this is from Joshua. During your time at the FCC, would the FCC take into account the repercussions, if any, for the international community when making regulatory decisions? So the answer is yes. We are not um, in, in this island. Um, you know, um, everything the FCC it does. Um, uh, the international, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, it has an international bureau because there's a recognition when you deal with spectrum and, and, and um, you know, satellite issues and, and, and other forms of communications that there are uh, 200 other nations that are impacted. So, um, you know, absolutely. Um, that goes, you know, depending on um, uh, the will of the president as channeled through the chair of the commission depends on what the weight is and, and what the severity, uh, you know, um, how much um, uh, into account, um, uh, you know, whatever decision, but uh, decisions are not made in a vacuum. The international, um, you know, implications are a part of the calculus. And so I guess the short answer with Joshua uh, um, it, it is yes. Um, I had the opportunity to travel to some of these nations to interact with members of the um, ITU and other um, international you know, organizations. And um, we do not um, act in vacuums. Um, we might not get along for, uh, politically, but we darn sure keep uh, connected uh, you know, from a communication standpoint. There are people that you will never see that are making sure that you know, these, uh, these lines of communication stay open. And even when we fight, there's a way for that communication to get to, to the other. So absolutely. Josh. Can I ask a follow-up? Of course. So do you think that the FCC has any responsibility to the international community also based on how many resources the U.S. has in providing other people with access? And I think one example that comes to mind is like the island of Cuba. Do you think the FCC, you know, should maybe like step into having more of an international role in well, I, I will say that you, especially during heightened seasons, you know, I'm from South Carolina, so I am, um, you know, uh, 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 sensitive to some of the environmental uh, challenges, uh, you know, like a, your, your fine state. Uh, when it comes to issues, particularly dealing with public safety um, and environmental, you know, you know, crises, the world comes together. You know, the world comes to, together in a crisis. And um, uh, again, um, uh, you know, uh, when things happen um, in Haiti, a few the, the the more recent, not this round, but the you know was that four or five years ago? I can't remember. You know, during okay. during, during that um, uh, crisis, there were teams from the FCC that were down there helping to 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 shore up, um, it, it, at least to triage in terms of the infrastructure. That happens um, all over the world. No matter how much the leaders don't get along, the communications community will come together in some form or fashion and, and the level to play, you know, you know, and ensure that the casualties are not more severe if there is a way for it, um, you know, to, to be strengthened um, through an international approach. As well as you've got um, 
international um, agencies like, like USAID that provide support um, outside of um, our borders uh, to uh, other nations to, to build up and support uh, emerging infrastructure. So the answer is, I'm a PK, a politician skid, I said earlier, so I give long answers. So the answer is yes, in a whole uh, host of ways. So I have, yeah. is there another question? On the I have a question. Can I oh, after no, you? You know what? <laughs> My question is shifting a bit from the international to the domestic. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned earlier about the infrastructure bill. Yes. Um, how do you suggest students that want to get more involved, whether it's activists or want to get into policy, how should we be paying attention to this or even getting involved or advocating for it? And what are some core issues that that infrastructure bill should target in your opinion? In my opinion, whatever the dollar amount um, that uh, you know the majority agrees on and the president signs, I think every penny of, of that should go to areas of need, areas where we that have been neglected, you know, areas where the uh, communications and digital divide, you know, where it's the widest. Uh, their communities where businesses can make the, um, the case for investment, they're gonna get theirs. Uh, those businesses are going to look out for their bottom line and they're going to build in those communities. These rural, low net worth in, in these big cities, um, in these hamlets uh, where, um, you know, there, there are not a lot of people and not a lot of scale or scope, those are the areas where you've got these chronic divides. So I believe um, that uh, that money should go first to areas of, um, that have been neglected, that have the most need. And the way that you as students and faculty and whoever else is, is weighing in, um, you should weigh in. You should ask for a seat at the table because some of the monies have already flowed pre this particular bill. You got recovery dollars uh, that the Florida already has access to. You will have more dollars coming to the state that Florida will have access to. So, um, you know, with uh, when the bill, um, you know, is, is signed. So you need to be at the table making sure that the communities that may not have the political wherewithal, that may not have the academic or data rich um, you know, uh, capacity to prove or make their case. You need to be there helping those communities to get what they deserve. It is not gonna happen by sitting there and say, woe is me. It is going to occur if the, the community of a whole, if, if, if students like you are there at these meetings, um, you know, making, um, you know, making the case, you know, using the uh, infrastructure on your campus, um, you know, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the initiative, the digital markets initiative and other data points that affirm the case here. You've got the data that you need. You, you've got to encourage those that have the political will and wherewithal to do what's right. And, and people are going to do what's right for them and not necessarily what's right for others first. So you need to be that backstop for those communities. Um, and every student on this campus and on this line has a capacity to be that backstop and that voice for those uh, who can't speak for themselves, in part because they're not connected. Yeah. I <laughs> uh, just want to make sure no one. We do have a new question. There is a new question. I want to get time for this. Sure. Okay. All right. So Jasmine has a question. As a construction management alumnus and personal experience, I am aware that certain areas of infrastructure has issues of fraud. Yes. How should we and or the FCC tackle these issues, especially in the industry? Checks and balances need to be in place. We've got uh, four universal service programs and one had been um, you know, demonized in its vulnerabilities. The Lifeline program was all over national media for the world to see. But there's another program, which is a bigger in scale and scope. Um, we now call it the Connect America Fund or the High Cost Fund, where there has been waste, fraud, and abuse. That people were taking the money that you contribute as a part of that, uh, uh, that contribution to fuel um, to fuel broadband-enabled uh, bills in this country. There were people spending money on meat, I kid you not, 
yard work, um, scholarships for their kids, mortgages. And I don't know if I've heard of, you know, anybody, um, you know, um, you know, in any type of prosecution, you know. So I, I'm saying that to not advocate of, you know, throwing a whole bunch of people in jail. That's not what I'm saying. But there has to be accountability. And when the a promise is not met, there has to be the appropriate, um, uh, you know, the appropriate answer uh, to that. That's the only way to me to make sure that we have the uh, matrix of that we're following the money, we, that we're making sure that um, it's properly uh, uh, um, spent um, to do everything we can uh, to, 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 to make sure that money is being spent appropriately. But if we miss it, and it is shown that they have done wrong, uh, that to the fullest extent of you know our, our, where our regulatory uh, tentacles can take us or abilities can take us, I think um, you know those few people should be held accountable and held publicly accountable uh, for um, for doing the wrong thing if that's the case. Mm -hmm. And just respond a quick question. Jasmine's asking about the reporting. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is recorded, and we'll be posting it to the Bob Graham Center's website, and it will be on the YouTube page. So we'll send that out via email. And email it to anyone who registered. Yeah. So. And we'll email it to everyone who registered. Uh, so my question is a little bit of a shift away from the FCC focus um, and more about this. You spoke earlier about a mentor you had that had gotten you into the regulatory space. And mm -hmm. our students have a finite amount of time here. They learn a lot of things. They participate in a lot of things. And I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about the importance of a mentor right. and how that helps you move along in life and different kinds of mentors. Right. Uh, you know, a lot of talk lately has, thank you for the question, a lot of talk lately has been about what the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that is important for you to make that distinction as you progress also. But I am a firm believer that you need validators, um, you know, in your, um, in, in your orbit, uh, that you need, you know, friends and associates that will help you along your way. And those friends and associates should include faculty, um, advisors, um, you know, board members to the institution. If there is a person or a program at this institution or affiliated with it that you are interested in, if you can see yourself in the next 15 or 20 years being like, you know, somebody in the, in the class of, um, I'll just say it, for 84, which is when I came out of, um, you know, college, you know, the old people that are about to retire. <laughs> um, um, make a connection. And if that person fails to get into, in touch with you, you know, we laughed and chuckled about it, chuckled about it earlier today, call their competitor. Mm -hmm. You know, if proximity matters, um, the quickest way to move from step A to step G is to have someone, you know, to help you navigate or to be your validator, or to be your sponsor. So do not, I mean, you know, you've got um, a lot of opportunities that most of us, I didn't do it. So I'm advising you to do something that I did not do. You've got these professors in these disciplines that had different lives before they got here, who some of them have, you know, parallel lives while they're here. They've got access and wisdom um, that um, you should take full advantage of while you were on this campus. Uh, because you just never know. And it's not using, it is, you know, um, you know, it is, I think, um, you pay the, you pay to be here, or if you're blessed enough, you know, you, they pay you to come here, regardless <laughs> you're here, you got admitted. Um, and everything on this campus affiliated with this campus, you should look as an opportunity, um, you know, to engage with that person, with that program, um, you know, uh, you know, with that field of study, even if it's not your, if, even if it is not your core field of study. So if you think you have an interest in it, and if, especially if there is a complement to your current discipline, go for it. Introduce yourself. You just, the, the people that I've met, the people who have looked out for me the most, at least initially, have not been from the same political party. My first contract was somebody not of the same political party. By the way, we've got nothing in common politically, but we've got the same connectivity goals. 
And the things that interest me the most have nothing to do with uh, banking or finance and economics. Mm -hmm. um, they might be based on those principles because again, you know, economics, it, you know, it, it does matter. But, you know, to look at things in a very narrow sense when you're on an institution, at an institution of higher learning, I don't think you do yourself a full service. So get out there, um, you know, go to a program, virtual or not, that's not in your core discipline that would stimulate you. That could be the, the light bulb that, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that shines the brightest in terms of your next step. Uh, there are very few straight lines uh, when it comes to opportunity and advancement. And I think that's a good thing. Because I'm bored with straight lines, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's really important. I liked how you ended that with sort of like bridging, finding something that is outside of your normal wheelhouse or outside of your major or what you normally do, and also the importance of connecting with folks who don't look like you, don't think like you, and, and don't exist in the same orbit as you. Because I think sometimes we hear one, the linear line, right? right. So Echo chambers, I find boring. Now, if you find them exciting and if it works for you, you know, go right ahead. I just think you will limit yourself in thinking. It is, I, I cannot sit here. Uh, I've got friends who watch as much blank news as blank news. And I go, you, you fill in the blanks yourself. I sometimes kind of do snippets of and, 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 and do more reading than, than, you know, in terms of how I consume my news because sometimes they both get on my nerves. Thanks for reason. But you learn from all, you know, again, those of you who are, especially if you're leaning toward going, you know, to law, and it's not just law, but it is important to know what others think. Um, I don't want to use the word opposition, but just for the sake of, you know, this the political, you know, it, it, those who do not think like you, who do not process like you, it is important to know what they think and why they think, um, you know, we are the sum total of our experiences. My dad would always say that until I would roll my eyes, but he's right. Um, you know, and we can be no more and no less than what our experiences um, you know, present themselves uh, to us. And I take a little exception to that because I think what he means you know, by that is that's a baseline, but it's not a ceiling. You know, Our experiences have brought us to this point and that's what we have, okay? That does not limit you in terms of series of next steps and, and, and those types of contacts that you will make or you know, those types of opportunities that are for you. They do color you, they might define you, um, you know, they might be, you know, they might be you, but it doesn't limit you. And so this is why, you know, you know, look at what others are thinking or or saying outside of um, your quote core line of reasoning or thought pattern because that is just you learn as much I learn more from my mistakes and from those who don't think like me than I do from my echo change I really do um, it might teach me what not to do <laughs> you know you know or how not to be but I learn as much as is is what I have gleaned either on my own or through my own um, interest Thank you, Jasmine. <laughs> I have a question that's a little bit different from the question, I guess, development, but more to, to you, like a personal, you mentioned you're not at FCC anymore, but what's no. next? What are you doing now and what are your plans going forward? Well, that's a, that's a great question and um, I, I will be transparent. Um, <laughs> so I've got, um, um, through my perpetual <laughs> evaluation of me right now, I am very fortunate to be on three corporate boards. Um, one you might have heard of, those of you who like entertainment, I'm on Lionsgate board. That's the one I tell everybody, I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm on Lionsgate board. I, I'm happy about that. And um, I, you know, to name the others, on you know, uh, uh, you know, Ring Central in a, an environmental cleanup company called Chara. Um, I also have a consulting model um, uh, type of um, you know professional experience. Uh, uh, lending strategic advice, particularly on the government of in the government affairs shops of, of various uh, companies um, and entities, from uh, uh, technology, telecom, you know, to media, and and so um, so that's what um, you know that's how I am at, at this stage. 
uh, that is how I am, you know, opting uh, to progress. So I'll see, you know, like I said, and I'm really serious about, it. you know, every six months, I look at it and see if it makes sense. Not so much economically, because, um, you know, I, I'm very fortunate, it does make sense, but rather not this is what I want. Um, it is not, though I know I need money to live, I, I understand all of that, but it's not money first for me. It is purpose, um, you know, it is purpose first. It is um, not one client do I have um, that I will say is outside of the principles I had as a regulator. Um, they are um, feisty in some uh, ways. They are uh, disruptors. Uh, they're attempting to innovate. And, and that's what motivates you know, me is the mission um, and, and the focus more so than the money. Because I think if you look at, if, you know, when I talk about blending you know, passion with purpose, I think if that is your baseline, if the principles are your baseline, the money will happen. They will follow because it's not inorganic, right? If you strictly go after money, you know, after the money first, second, and third, and forget the rest of it, it is easy for you to, to move into territory that might not be in a, on the long run, um, you know, very enriching for you. So don't let temporary um, games, um, even, uh, you know, game changing. Um, I've had a couple of game changing opportunities and I've seen the announcements and I had to breathe kind of hard and I had a couple of my family members like, this is, could have been you. <laughs> and I, yeah, it really could have been and I could have been, you know, coming down here on my private jet, okay? But I was in row 11. <laughs> I was on the second leg of a flight, and I'm okay with that. I really am okay with that because I can look at myself in the mirror and, um, and I don't have to second guess any decision that I made. Have I made mistakes? Yeah. But I don't have to second guess by way of principles, or you know morality and the like. I, I made a decision. Um, you know I believed in the, the cause of the company, and um, the you know it's up to me to determine. Um, you know um, you know ultimately the, the right answer. Um, even though a couple of my clients, some of my friends are still mad at me about, but I stick to uh, I, I stick to it because your friends are often right. They're not always right, <laughs> so, but you want them to check you now. But they're not always right. Because you have to do what's best for you. And um, you have to enable them to do what is best for them. Now, don't let your friends dictate what you say, but let them, you make sure they keep you in check. I just, I thought that that works for me. Do you guys have any questions? Well, one question is, are you still working on um, making telephone calls for prisoners to their family more affordable? I am still on those calls. Um, I, I, I don't make them every week, but I am still uh, working uh, with that group and they have had some recent successes in um, some states and jurisdictions. And yes, I, that will be something um, that I will do until every corner of this nation has just and reasonable rates. So, um, so you know, absolutely, they, they know that um, you know that this is this is a lifelong commitment. Um, absolutely. And to our viewers online, does anybody have any concluding questions? Um, because if not, I definitely have one that I'll pop in. Okay. Um, so I guess just kind of closing up, would you have any parting thoughts or words for students that, you know, I know you mentioned a couple of tips, um, but advice for students that are going into policy or are graduating and want to go to work with policy, any closing tips or advice? I will say remain open um, to opportunities inside and outside of government. Do not, um, you know, let anyone guilt you for going through, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think a negative refrain about what they call revolving doors. Like people go into government, they go into private industry and they come back. Look, um, the only thing I will say to that is that if you take that course, make sure that you always answer uh, to your client. When you go into government, your client is American people. You should not compromise them on their values. You should not you bring what you learn from private industry, but not the 
goals of private industry inside of government because government should not and is not a business. You know, a lot of people are like it should be run like a business. The customer is the American who cannot get that good or service in elsewhere affordably. They don't have access to it in the private sector. So government is there as a backstop and government is answerable to you and your need. So I think the ultimate calling is public service, um, but I am not for one day guilty about, you know, after 19 years leaving and, and doing something else. So affirm your goals and your principles in ways and along paths of opportunities that come your way, be discerning, you know, evaluate them, making, make sure they're good. Don't settle. <laughs> Did I mention not to settle? <laughs> you know, don't settle. I know th there's a fine line of doing what's in the meantime. As soon as you settle, the optimal opportunity comes your way. That's what I mean by settling. And I'm not saying start. That is not what I'm saying. But don't settle more so by way of principles in order to eat. I'm telling you that is a slippery slope, um, you know, that you will have a hard time, um, you know, coming back from. But make sure that whatever you may have to do in the meantime is a stepping stone for what you want to do in the long term. Do not do or agree on doing anything that is limiting, um, you know, that will close doors of opportunities. Do not take any course or a field of study uh, that would, would be so narrow that if something happens in that discipline, you don't have a fallback. Have an A, B, and C plan. Because sometimes A is a long, long journey. And B and C will feed you. Now, did I contradict myself? Maybe just a little. <laughs> but again, there's a difference from doing something in the meantime and settling. I, I just think, and, and you'll know what it is when you see it. So I will just, you know, say again, you know, what I said before. Take advantage of these opportunities that you have at what I think for many of you is the most free time in your life. It might not be free to attend this campus. You might be balancing a lot of jobs. But in terms of your life's journey, this is the most freedom you will ever have. Take advantage of what's on this campus, what this campus opens up the doors of opportunities uh, you know, for you to do. I promise you will have fewer regrets if you do. My goal is to have no more regrets. Your goal should be to have no more regrets. Take advantage of every opportunity you have before you. Um, savor the moment. Um, you know, explore. And to be honest with you, go out and leave this world better than you found it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Oh, we have one last question. <laughs> okay. Go ahead and. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So Jasmine is asking, since you have multiple hats, do all chairs have the ability to do both political and personal industry stances, or does it have very does it vary per chair? Also, is there a record database of past chairs and their works? Sorry if this question seems redundant. So if you were to go on the FCC's website on the last one, you have uh, you know all of the past commissioners that are named. Um, you talked about multiple hats. Let me see if I'm interpreting do all chairs have the ability. So having the, the ability, yes. Do they have either the will? That, that, that's the variance. Um, so, um, you, you know, um, how far or, you know, I mean, what, what, whatever your risk tolerance are like, you know, that might vary. But they absolutely, it, I will say, I will affirm this. Being an FCC uh, you know, commissioner and interim chair was the most enriching and second to going to college, the most liberating you know, opportunity I've ever had. You can be as passive 
or as aggressive by way of being a subject matter expert as possible. Guess what? Unless you do something wrong, you still want to be there. For me, it was about, and this sounds a little morbid, but this is how I function. It was always about what my FCC tombstone would read. I know that sounds weird. I'm weird like that. Um, but, you know, and, and, and that's just another way of me saying, what is your leg? You know, what's your legacy? And, and, and so, you know, so that was it. That was my North Star for me. What do I want people to say? Not necessarily what I accomplished, but what I attempted to do in terms of goal, you know, those goals. What did I want people to say to me? And I remember one headline that said, and I'll just take it, when this headline said, you know, ridiculously productive. That's what I want. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of headline you want because people are not saying that you got it all right, mm -hmm. but that you made an attempt to do it abundantly. That's what you want for yourself. So thanks, Jasmine. I think you might, I think you win, win the frequent question award. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Our next event will be on October 5th. We will be having an open house at the Graham Center at here at Pew Hall. Check out our Facebook, our Instagram, all the medias, and we'll have more information. Thank you for, our participation, for your participation. And we'll have more careers in public service um, events upcoming. Just keep, uh, keep an eye out on our socials to find out when. Thank you again. My so pleasure. Much, Commissioner Clifford. It was really a pleasure meeting you. Thank, thank you, and good bye for now.